Allen and some others that Jim will mention. So uh, let's give him the kind of uh, welcome that we do here at the Little Rock Touchdown Club when it's time. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Rasco, come on up. Okay, today's guest speaker grew up in Daly City, California, where he attended elementary school with future Pro Football Hall of Famer John Madden. He attended the University of Oregon, where he played in for Oregon's 1958 Rose Bowl team. He began his coaching career at his alma mater, where he served as assistant for 12 seasons, then three years at Southern Cal as offensive coordinator under John McKay. McKay had been assistant coach when coach was playing at Oregon. Then coach served one year with the Oakland Raiders under John Madden. So in 1976, after paying his dues as an assistant for 16 years, he was named head coach of the Southern California Trojans. In his first season, the Trojans lost their opening game, but then won 11 in a row, including a victory over Michigan in the Rose Bowl. Trojans were ranked number two in the nation in the final polls. In his second season, USC beat Texas A&M 47 to 28 in the Blue Bonnet Bowl. In his third season, USC went 12 and one, beat Michigan in the Rose Bowl again, finished number two in the AP poll, but were declared national champions in the coaches poll conducted by the United Press. In his fourth season, the Trojans were undefeated, 11 wins and one tie. They beat Ohio State in the Rose Bowl. That was his third Rose Bowl victory in four seasons as a head coach. They were ranked number two in the final polls and tailback Charles White won the Heisman Trophy. In 1981, another of his Trojan tailbacks, Marcus Allen, was awarded the Heisman Trophy. After seven seasons as a head man at USC, coach went to the National Football League's Los Angeles Rams as head coach in 1983. He was named NFL Coach of the Year after taking the Rams to the playoffs in his first season. The Rams made the playoffs six times in his nine seasons, twice reached the NFC title game, both times losing to the eventual Super Bowl champions, the 85 Chicago Bears and the 1989 San Francisco 49ers. After one season as a television analyst, he returned to Southern Cal and remained there through 1997. In his first year back, the Trojans won the Freedom Bowl. The next year, he won his second Cotton Bowl. The following season, he won his fourth Rose Bowl and his fourth appearance. He retired for one year and then took over at Nevada, Las Vegas in 1999. In winding up this introduction, I do want to mention two games when he was head coach at UNLV. He'll never forget these two games. In September of 1999, UNLV faced Baylor in the second game of the season, coach's second game at UNLV. Baylor led 24 to 21 with less than 20 seconds left in the game, and Baylor had the ball on the UNLV eight yard line. And UNLV had no more timeouts. Wouldn't we all agree that most coaches would have taken a knee and taken the win? But Baylor's new head coach, Kevin Steele, thought that Baylor could stuff in one last touchdown and come away with a more convincing victory. You can guess what happened. Coach Robinson called the right defense because Steele called for a running play. Baylor fumbled at the one. Kevin Thomas of UNLV scooped it up and returned it 99 yards for a touchdown and a UNLV victory. Brilliant, Brilliant coach. <laughs> the following season, UNLV won the Mountain West Conference. Our guest was named the coach of the year for the conference and UNLV was selected to host the Las Vegas Bowl on December the 21st, 2000. I will omit the details <laughs> of the game, but I will report the final score. No booing, please. UNLV 31, Arkansas 14. This was our speaker's last bowl game and brought his lifetime bowl record to 8-1, which remains the best bowl record of any college coach in NCAA history. In 12 seasons at Southern Cal, his teams won 104 games, had one shared national title, and four Rose Bowl victories. With that record, it's no surprise that in 2009, he was elected to the College Football Hall of Fame. But before he was a coach, let's go back to January 1, 1958, the Rose Bowl, Pasadena, California, Ohio State versus the University of Oregon. And left in, for the University of Oregon, number 87, John Robinson. Thank you. Save that for me. We could use it as an obituary. <laughs> 
great to be here. We're all undefeated. That's a great thing about being at this time of year. Hell, we haven't lost. Nobody's bitching. <laughs> Even a guy thinks you're going to win the national championship. <laughs> yeah. He's probably drunk. <laughs> Dave and I talked a little bit last night, man. He mentioned that uh, my wife grew up in New Orleans, went to LSU, and she's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> about the Southeastern Conference. I'm, I know more about this damn conference. <laughs> Every morning, anything about the South, Southeast, she puts right down there on, on my uh, table. And so I, uh, I, uh, I really have learned to appreciate all the good things about LSU and the South and all that. We met at a bank. She was a bank officer, and, and um, she came up, and for some reason, somebody asked her to, to say hello to me. And she's, I told her, I said, oh, LSU. I, we played back in LSU in 1979. She said, I remember. She said, I was there. And I said, oh, well, great. And, I, and yeah, as you know, they're nasty, nasty people <laughs> in <the> LSU. <laughs> And she said, you cheated to win the game. <laughs> and she was right. <laughs> we had to have split crews back then. You know, half of the referees were from officials were from our conference, half from the Southeast. And the, the uh, umpire was a, happened to be a friend of mine. And <laughs> in our last drive, he called a face mask on, a, on an on LSU guy, gave us the first down, we went and scored and won. And she, and she remembered. I said, well, I got to get to know this lady. <laughs> I said, don't, don't I remember you? Weren't you the lady that uh, was leaning over the edge of the thing there when I walked out giving me the finger? <laughs> <laughs> she said, yes. <laughs> so I, I have a bit of an education on that. As the introduction said, I grew up in the, in the West. I always been well. I was born in in Chicago, but grew up in the West. John Madden and I grew up together from the third grade on. We're still best of friends. And the thing I always remember about friendship is that how a guy can help you when you really need one. And I, when I was first hired at SC, I was a very anonymous guy and nobody knew. And I thought, well, I need some star power. They're having this big event, and they wanted that I was going to be introduced, and I said, I get John to come down. Now, John is afraid to fly, and he always goes by bus, and he was bitching. He didn't want to come, and finally, I prevailed upon him to drive down from the Bay Area to Southern California on his bus. He comes down, and I go to pick him up, and he parks the bus somewhere, and I go to pick him up, and uh, he comes out of the bus and gets in the car and gets in the back seat. Now, now, John was kind of famous at the time, but it's my buddy. What the hell are you doing in the back seat? He hands me a chauffeur's cap. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a big fat ass. He, 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 he. Anyway, we're driving now, and, and we're, we're kind of late, and he's bitching in the back seat, and I'm going to LA traffic, and I'm weaving in and out. And sure enough, police come up behind me, and the lights on, they pull me over, and I'm frustrated and nervous about this event and all that. Cop comes in, I roll down the window, and I, before he can say anything, I say, officer, what was I doing? I wasn't doing anything. Hell, I'm, you know. And he says, well, first of all, he says, you didn't have your seatbelt on. I said, oh, I had my seatbelt on. I just took, he said, you did not have your seatbelt. I, yes, I did. And it was, the conversation was going very badly. And I finally found a use for this idiot in the back seat. <laughs> I said, officer, there's a great American back here, Raider coach, famous NFL, Super Bowl champion, great announcer, uh, John Madden. And the cop looks and says, hey, Coach Madden, hey, man, you're my favorite coach. I said, I'm in now, baby. I said, why don't we let him decide whether I had my seatbelt on? He's, he's honest. And I, you know, and the officer says, yeah, Coach Madden, did this jerk have a seatbelt on or not? John, you know, kind of gets a TV pose up and he said, Officer, I've known this man for 40 years. He said, and I know better than to ever argue with him when he's been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that
That's what friends are for. <laughs> I still have that cap. I have it just one, whenever I'm in. But I got, a I got a chance to coach it. I was at the University of Oregon uh, for a long time. And when I was there, we were the bottom of the heap. We had the least, we had a stadium that sat up and seated about 28,000 people. And they, at my, at the same time I was there, they had a runner, a long distance runner, average long distance runner by the name of Phil Knight, who later, who later started uh, Nike Shoes. He, he, would, he and Bill Barham, the track coach, he would put these shoes in his, in, his, in his trunk. They'd get them from Taiwan or some damn place, and they'd put them in his trunk. And he would drive around to various high schools selling these, these shoes. I think they called it National Shoe Company, and they later changed it to Nike. Now, I kind of treated this guy like he, he, was, he dressed right next to me, and I was, was pushing him out of the way. I said, get the hell out of the way, you know? <laughs> If I'd have known, I'd have just kissed his butt all over. <laughs> but he's, he is now, as Phil Knight, has now made Oregon one of the powers in football in the United States. He's given them over a billion dollars. He's built a new law school, a new basketball arena, um, has expanded the stadium. They have, they have the best damn facilities of any school in, in the country. And... Uh, he doesn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but he was, he's, he's done some great things there. So now when you look at the Pac-12 and you look at Oregon, you think, what the hell are they doing as the most powerful or one of the most powerful? But I think they're going to continue to be. They have a very good coach, uh, and they're going to be, be very, very good. Uh, but I started at USC and, uh, and uh, was, an assistant, was an assistant there for three years under, under John McKay. My first game as an assistant was here in Arkansas. This was 1972. In Arkansas, Joe Ferguson was a quarterback who was really, as you remember, a great quarterback. And we came here, and were, it was going to be a close game, I think. And we, we, I don't know what the score was, but it was the beginning of the best season USC ever had. We won every game. We were unanimous, unanimous national champions and uh, uh, just had a great season. We came back. Two years later, initial first game here in town, and we were ranked pretty high, and we got the hell kicked out of us. Huh? Anybody here remember going to that that game? Just kicked the hell out of us. And and on the way home, the entire coaching staff got fired <laughs> three different times. McKay, who was a little bit violent at times, and uh, uh, would storm up and down the aisle and yelling at us and uh, uh, but being fired three times wasn't bad you know I mean that but we won the national championship that year we came back and, and did better and uh, and I got hired as as the coach after he left and went to, went to Tampa I went up to the Raiders John Madden and I connected again I went up there as his offensive coordinator now the Raiders are different I mean and, and back then the Raider was, they were a great football team. Kenny Stabler was the quarterback. Now, Kenny was different. Uh, I, don't know, I, I don't know how you remember him in Alabama, but, but at the Raiders, he was. Now, Kenny would be hung over every night. He'd be out on, on the streets. And my first, our first road game, we're playing Denver Broncos. And we're staying at a hotel that had kind of separate, separate buildings. And, Kenny Stabler, uh, George Blanda, uh, uh, Fred Bolitnikoff, all were in the same room. And 11 o'clock, I had bed check. They don't show up. And uh, I wait till 11.15, and I, I didn't want to turn them in. Because, you know, back then, they, they didn't make that much money, but the fine was big. So 12 o'clock comes, 12.30, I thought, these guys are dead. <laughs> and I go down and tell John Madden, and John's dying. Oh my God, what are we going to do? We're out there standing out in front of them, 2 30. Here they come. And they're, it, it's like a movie, you know, their cars weaving <laughs> in, and they're hanging out the windows and all, you know, and oh God. And they, and they come, and they were great people and great players, and John loved them. And they all get out of the car and they're hugging John. <laughs> and John's screaming, I'll find your house. I thought, 
man, this pro football is tough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the next day, Kenny was 26 out of 32 or something like that. We won by two touchdowns. I said, Drip, it's not a bad deal. <laughs> He, he was hit, but I I was just uh, up there one year and came and came back as the head coach. So <clears throat> I had a great a great run at this, and it was very fortunate having having great players. And uh, um, SC at the time we, we were pretty much on top. I mean, we were going to be one of the top teams in the country, uh, you know, with with some some assured assured. We, however, never did quite. Take advantage of the opportunity we have to build the kind of facilities that that you all have here in 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 the southeast. Uh, we allowed ourselves to go fall behind, and just now we have built a 75 million dollar athletic building uh, that's just completed. Our team just moved, moved in last week, really at the start. So we're uh, very excited about that. Our program is back, going strong. After after. A number, number of years at SC, I went to the Rams, and uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, Georgia Frontieri was the owner of the Rams. I was there nine years. I'm going straight to heaven after <laughs> after all of that because she was she was really something. She's a nice lady, but she her husband died, and she took over the team. And she, for some reason, had people telling her, "You can run an NFL team." And so I would get phone calls um, with advice and wisdom <laughs> on how to run the team. Probably the most dramatic that I remember was we were, and we were a good team. We were in the playoffs just about every year. And um, she called me and said, you've got to come up to LA. I, we were down in Orange County. She said, you've got to come up to LA. Uh, we are, we have news that will change the history of Ram football. And, oh my God, they're trading for John Elway or something, you know. It was exciting. And she called some other people, and I drive up there and get there in her house. She had a huge dining room, and we're all standing around. Nobody knows. <laughs> she walks in with, uh, at her side is a little guy with long gray hair and a flowing beard. She, you know, a guy right off the streets in Hollywood somewhere and had a long robe on. And she introduced him as the Maharishi Mahahogi Bogi Dogi. <laughs> and she said, this man is going to change the future of the Rams. You know, and I'm going, oh man. <laughs> Why didn't I stay at USC? <laughs> but she, she commenced to tell us that the Yogi Hogi Pokey was <laughs> going to give each player a crystal amulet. <laughs> and the player was going to wear them around his neck. Now, it's a true story. <laughs> and that would make us invisible. <laughs> now, visualize the head coach of an NFL <laughs> standing in front of him saying, Fellows? <laughs> So we do everything we can to, <laughs> to try to discredit this guy and through dinner and all that. And the guy was a general manager, and I, boy, we we're working. Now, he was going to do this for a half a million dollars. Now, he wasn't a, he was an <laughs> ambitious con man. This guy. <laughs> and finally, we got him. And he finally, we, we hit on him. We asked him, what were you before you became the Maharaja Yogi Yogi Pogi Dogi? <laughs> and he said, oh, he said, I was a drywall contractor. <laughs> 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 So that's pro football. <laughs> but we, uh, but I, I went back to SC, was there a while, and then, then retired, and then went to UNLV. Now that was quite an experience. Uh, Las Vegas is an experience unto its own, and, and coaching there was really quite an experience. The school was impoverished, I mean, in terms of, we didn't have any money, we didn't have anything. Uh, and but you know it was it was a fun experience. The game here against Arkansas when we played in that bowl game. Now it was it was kind of fun. It was it was a setup because your team came out there and and they were they were 
focused on Vegas. They could have played the city of Las Vegas and won, but they, <laughs> they didn't know who in the hell you had. And they all had, I remember Houston and that said, we're really quite, you know, glad to have a chance to come here and play you and LV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, you know. <laughs> but we had a pretty good team and we won the game. But we came back, we came down here the next year, as, as Dave said. And, and I made the one, one of the worst coaching errors I've ever made. I had a freshman punter, and he looked like he was 14. <laughs> and I don't know how we had him, but our regular punter was just having an awful night, just awful. And we had punted bad, and the ball was wet. And we, if we punt the ball, we, it's right a minute to go in the game. If we just punt the ball down, as Dave said, your offense was awful. And <laughs> if we just punt the ball down, we win the game. Well, ball's at midfield, and I put this kid in. And I said, are you ready to go in there and punt? And he goes, yes! And, you know, I, I said, oh, man. Uh, that, uh, and I put him in. And the snap came right back to him, and it went right through him, hit him, and the helmet ball rolled down. Arkansas picked up the gun. And, and, and I, if I'd have had a gun, I would have come and see a because it was just so uh, such an obvious mistake. <laughs> but anyway, the, when I got off the airplane today, I, I ran. I ran just before I saw Dave. I ran into a guy who was a Ram fan, a California guy who was I don't know what he was on. He said, "Hey, I remember you at the Rams." He said, "I loved you when you coached the Rams." He said, "Man, you were special." I said, "Well, thank you." And I'm surprised the guy remembered. You know, he said, "I always thought of you." in the same light as Billy Graham. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, you and Billy Graham. He said, you, two, both, the two of you could fill Anaheim Stadium. And he said, and within 10 minutes, have everybody there saying, Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> that was, I wasn't sure what he meant about that. But, The whole game of football has been great, and you know, and, and it's moving fast. College football is moving very fast. I don't think anybody knows where it's going, uh, what's going to, what it's going to be 12 years from now. The television issue is just huge. It's huge in LA. Uh, it's kind of the the Dodgers. I don't know if you noticed today, the Dodgers traded, they paid millions of dollars trading for a couple of guys, and uh, but. They are about to negotiate a four or five billion dollar con a local television contract. So the television industry is going to change and it's going to affect college football. Pac-10 has always been a kind of a poor conference in terms of income. We don't draw in, in many of the stadiums very much. But the Pac-10 now has signed a television contract, so there's money to burn. So a lot of the Pac-12 teams are, are, are just really in reinvesting. One of the programs out there that should have been good all through the years, UCLA, uh, has been lousy for about 10 years. They just don't invest in the money. Now they're, we're going to see some changes there. Uh, attendance will begin to happen. And so I think we'll see the Pac-10, or the Pac-12, rather. I can't get used to saying that. Um, beyond the rise. The level of football just isn't the same as it is here. Year in and year out, USC had played when John McKay was there and I was there. We played the Alabama type football, the big, powerful guys, offensive linemen, uh, <clears throat> running backs that were going to try to dominate you. The program at SC has changed dramatically now. Now we're a passing team. We have the Probably the best quarterback in in the country. Although I know you have a good good one here, uh, but um, uh, Matt Barkley is is coming back for a senior year, and we have two really great receivers. So we're going to be in a passing team, which I still can't get used to. You know, and I, I stand on the sidelines and say, "Give the ball to the tailback," <laughs> and Lane Kiffin looks over and says, "We did last quarter." <laughs> <laughs> but we have a coach that was controversial when he was hired. I kind of said, what are we doing? And and he doesn't vacation in Tennessee, I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but he has come in, and, and a very young coach, only 35, and, and has 
has really done an outstanding job. We are under NC2A penalty, uh, which we still are. Uh, our bowl ban is over. But we only can, for two years now, we've only been able to recruit 15 players. And next year, we'll only be able to recruit 15 players. In each of those years, we're, we've been ranked in recruiting in the top five or six in the country. So, so we're fighting our way through that fair, fairly well. Uh, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's going to be an in, in, interesting, interesting year. I hope we get out, out here. I hope we play Arkansas in the, in the, in the national championship game. And uh, uh, I've already got red on, so I, I, can, I can wear this same shirt and pretend like I'm with you guys if, if you're way ahead. <laughs> Let me answer any questions. Anybody? Right, I'm going to start first, Coach. That's, that's the only thing I get out of the, doing this touchdown club. I get to ask the first question. Last night you were talking about, if you could just real quickly reference your coaching against Coach Brules, obviously with the Arkansas connection in those 70s games, and uh, maybe your relationship against some of the other coaches like the Schimbecklers who you went up against. And then maybe the fact that you mentioned Marcus Allen, you coached Marcus Allen, Charles White, uh, and Eric Dickerson. Maybe talk about those greatness of those backs along with some of the great coaches you coached against. Well, as far as the backs, it was all coaching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Marcus was Marcus Allen was from San Diego, uh, and was a great was a great all around high school player. Was not a runner. Was a quarterback. Uh, we recruited him as a defensive back, and uh, changed after about two days. But uh, Eric Dickerson was the number one high school football player in the world, and. Uh, we went down to recruit him. We, we flew him out, had him at the, at the Rose Bowl, did everything you could do. <laughs> and back then, you could have guys on the sideline at games. And, and we had him at the Rose Bowl, and he's on the sideline. And, uh, Marcus Allen's running up and down, and I run, run down there and say, Eric, that's your job. Next year, you're <laughs> going to be that guy. He goes, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and he left, and hell, he's coming to see him. Two weeks later, uh, we go to uh, Sealy, Texas, where he was, Eric's from, and we pull up, my assistant coach and I pull up in front of the thing, and park, we parked right next to the really a great looking, I think it was a Trans Am, <laughs> Pontiac Trans Am, and Eric's mom is sitting in it. <laughs> and I, I say to John, do you think that's a bad sign? <laughs> Said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we go in, and, and Eric was a good guy. I mean, he always was a good guy. And, and we said, he said, coaches, you, you just don't understand. He said, you guys aren't even close. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I can't consider you at all. And, you know, and he laughed about the car. And, uh, and he said, we packed our bag and left town. And on the way out, I said, I'll eventually get you someday. And, and I did, uh, because I drafted him with the Rams, first round pick. And, and uh, he came out and had a great career with the Rams. And, and we, we, it was one of the worst things our organization ever did was uh, we didn't really understand how important he was. And we got in a contract dispute, uh, dispute and we traded. We had everything geared for him. He would, he would still be the number, the number one rusher in the world if, if we had have kept him, because we had an off, great offensive line, everything geared for, for him to succeed. But he was a great back and never got hurt, you know, very seldom ever. And, and we gave him the ball 30, 35 times a game. You know how now? And, and it's true in college, too. It, it's irritating. A guy runs, makes seven yards, and he gets up and taps his head, I'm, uh, take me out. You know, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> are you thirsty? <laughs> you want a sandwich? What? what? <laughs> but it's, uh, somehow players, they, players can't take it anymore. Can't wear him down. Hell, we, I gave the ball to Ricky Bell, who's a great player, 53 times in, wow. in, in one game. Humane Society called me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but I, I was privileged to be. Frank Broyles was a good friend of John McCase. They were the same era ahead of me. And, and, and uh, Frank Broyles came out and taught John McKay and, and us uh, the. Uh, uh, 
Arkansas slant defense, angle defense, I think it was called. It was a revolutionary defense, and he he started it, and uh, it was it was the biggest thing in, at, at the time in football. And and, and uh, I can remember sitting in the booth. Uh, John McKay was was a great vodka drinker, the best. He had the NC two A record for vodka, <laughs> and he never got drunk. And when you sat in a booth of now, I don't think I don't think Frank Burrell's drank, and but we're all sitting in the booth, and we order a vodka, and we were there three hours, and 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 McKay never bothered him. I sat there the three hours, and when they left, I, I was face down <laughs> in, in, in the booth. But we did save all those notes. But that was a wonderful, wonderful education for a young coach. Here are the two really legendary coaches. Uh, Talking football. I think f coaches back then were more like assistant coaches. The famous head coaches were just guys. Uh, Bo Schembechler and I were friends. Joe Joe Paterno was uh, the same way. Just guys, you know. And they weren't. They didn't have airplanes and all that stuff, you know. They, hell, they were just guys that wore tennis shoes and you know, sweatshirts, you know. Uh, but that's all changed. Now we also made about twenty-five thousand a year. <laughs> Players and coaches on that staff, and the 1971 season was interesting. I'd love to hear your comments about that, please. Well, I, I, you know, the 1971 season in Oregon, when Jerry Free was asked to fire George Seifert, what did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, we had some. We had Dan Fouts was the quarterback, and, and uh, Ahmad Rashad was the tailback. We had a good. We we had a, we, we led the nation in, in offense that year. I was the offensive coach, and they fired my ass. I don't, I, I don't know why. I can't. No, I can't dare see right after that. But that, but that was a good team. But Oregon never w was able to burst into that top level like they have now. Um, okay. First, uh, I have a two-part question. But first, I just want to say, since the beginning of the season, I think the greatest sport in the entire world is college football, and especially Southeast Conference football. I sincerely believe that. Is, Let me introduce you to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Is, you are Southern Cowman. You're famous out there for the beautiful, fantastic weather. How much of that big advantage is it for UCLA and USC to use the weather as a recruiting tool? And you've got Beverly Hills and Hollywood to put some glamour. And the other half is why is it that San Diego State University with the ocean, the beautiful city of weather, they can't seem to get a top-notch program. Well, they're a, they're a, a state-supported school, and it's the college system. So they have no budget at all. San Diego State is a urban university. San Diego, I, I live down by San Diego now. It's a great place, great place to go to school. But it isn't, it, 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 it's an inner-city school in terms of you know, most of the students are, are, are commuters type of students, so it doesn't have the kind of campus, and they've never had a budget to focus on for football. They are now, and they're doing well. The uh, Brady Hoke, who's the ma coach of Michigan, was there a couple years and re really helped that pro program. The, the weather is, yeah, the weather's, yeah, that's good, I, and all, all of that, uh, but you know, kids, 18 years old, they don't care about weather, you know. Now girls, you care about girls, you know, but most kids are, are, are I think where they're going to live, who their teammates are, chance to get on and play in the NFL, to run an offense that's a little bit like what you might run in the NFL, those are, are, are uh, things that are recruiting. But if you're Alabama or you're Arkansas or you're, you're um, LSU, you've got as good a chance to recruit just because you're, you're in such a, a, a dramatic environment for, for this game. Anybody else? I have one. A coach of all the great teams that you coached against, uh, maybe name uh, your greatest team as a Southern Cal coach, and then maybe the toughest team or the greatest team you ever coached in your college career. And of course, I was going to ask the NFL would have to be the 49ers, maybe talk about what it was like to go up against that group. 
Well, we had a great team in 79, 78 and 79. We won the national championship, and we, we had great teams. My, the team you saw here in 72, the, R, the USC team, that was truly a great team. Who was on that team? Who was some of players on that team? God, I can't remember. That was a long time ago. <laughs> I've got Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> I'm pretty good before lunch, but not so good after. <laughs> but, uh, but we had some, we had, we really did have a great, when I was with the Rams, we played the 85 Bears, uh, that great team, that great defensive team. We played them, you know, the winner went to the Super Bowl and we played them. So, so Soldiers Field. Now, I had an old friend of mine that, that was a captain of our college uh, team, Norm Chapman was his name. And I called Norm, I said, Norm, come on back with us to Chicago and see this game. And he was really excited, flew back on a plane with us. And this is the NFC Championship game, and that's that great Bear team with all those guys. And, uh, Mike Dick is the coach, and they were wild. It was wild. <laughs> And we, we're standing on the sideline, and he's standing down there about, uh, about 20 feet in, in the warm-up. And the Chicago Bear linebackers come running out, and one of them, I forget which one it was, runs right over, and boom, headbutts Norm, knocks him. It was snowing there. <laughs> knocks him. There's a poor guy from Oregon just standing there. And hits him, knocks him out back in, in, the, in, in the snowbank. And I thought, oh, my God. What, and, 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 of course, Norm was had a few concussions and and was jumps up and thought it was great. Said, God damn <laughs> <laughs> I should have played him, hell <laughs> We got beat pretty good, but they they were anybody else? Yeah. Hey, you remember the halftime speech in seventy four in Notre Dame? Uh John McKay, yeah. Oh yeah. What was that? Uh we were we were we're going to win the national championship if we win the, that game. And we play Notre Dame in the Coliseum, and we're behind 24 to nothing. And we well, actually we're behind uh, 17 to nothing. And we have the ball in our own 25. And for some reason, John McKay decides to go for it. And I, I mean, it was crazy. He, he, he was losing it. He really was. <laughs> As we all have. <laughs> and he sends Pat Hayden, who's a little guy. Pat was our quarterback. He, he sends in a quarterback sneak, fourth and what? Notre Dame had these big jug butt defensive tackles. And they sent, you know, the goal line defense. They come in, and the big fat ass is right in there. <laughs> and I said, Coach, they got their goal line in. And, and he is. I'm glad it was not on TV because he is shoving me out on the field to call timeout or to do, I don't know what the hell he wanted me to do. <laughs> but I got the headset and it's choking me and he's shoving me. And Pat Hayden uh, runs a quarterback sneak, loses three yards, you know. Boom, Notre Dame scores 24 to nothing. It's the most shocking first half result ever. And we get a touchdown just at halftime, but we go in, and now McKay could go around the bent pretty good, you know. And, but he comes in there at halftime and and gets all the guys, kind of like the, the Boy Scouts, you know, when you get around a fireside. And it really was. And he says, and he gets in the middle and sits down and says, <laughs> fellows. I thought, oh boy, he's, <laughs> he's really gone. And he talked to him kind of in a soothing voice. He said, we're really. He said, this, I'm prouder of this team than any team I've ever coached. He says, we're jittery somehow, but playing for the national championship is, you know, it's gotten to us. And, and we didn't talk any football at all. And then it's time to go out. We go out. We run the opening kickoff. We had a guy named Anthony Davis. We run the opening kickoff back and score 55 straight points and beat uh, those dirty, rotten Catholics. Uh, I was raised a Catholic. But that rivalry was really special. My first time back at, at South Bend, and it's a great place, like a lot of players. It's one of the great places to play. Our bus pulls up, and there are hundreds of people around. And I get off the bus, and I was Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school, taught by the nuns and all that. And there are two nuns standing right there. And they're, you know, they don't wear that stuff anymore, but you remember when they, and they're standing there. And I get off, and I go, hi, sisters. 
and the one looks at me and says, we're going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bad sign. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Oh, one more. John's, uh, John's not doing any television. Uh, he's kind of retired. He lives in Pleasanton, um, California, East Bay, um, uh, or East, East part of the San, San Francisco Bay. Um, he's sitting on his ass, I think, kind of <laughs> like he was with when he sat in the back of the car. He, he's a, uh, he has a committee. The commissioner of the NFL uses John uh, as kind of his future committee. I mean, where football is going. So much of the NFL is so big business. Most of the power people in the NFL are not football people. And I think the commissioner worries about that and wants to keep you know, that perspective in there. And so John does some of that. And um, other than that, I, I keep thinking he's going to try to come back, but he's, you know, he, he, when, he always said the difference between he and I, and this is true, when we were kids, we'd be walking down the thing and, and there'd be a quarter on the ground, or two quarters, and John would pick up one and I'd pick up the other. John would put his in his pocket and I would say, hey, fellas, we got a quarter. Let's go get an ice cream. <laughs> and John saved a lot of those quarters. <laughs> he bought a huge amount of it. had that in Madden games. Yeah, that made, has made him three or four hundred million dollars. So uh, I'm nice to John every chance I see. <laughs> uh, last question. I've heard you mention the Bears, the Chicago Bears, that 85 team you coached against. You were on a coach of the great Oakland Raiders team. He coached against the 49ers. If, of all those teams, which would which would win? Which was the best of those three? Would you say? You know, all of them kicked the hell out of us. <laughs> but but I, the 49ers, Joe Montana. Joe Montana is the best player I've ever been around. Uh, I thought he was the ultimate winner. You know, guy. Um, and uh, he, he, so I think that 49. Bill Walsh was a great coach. Those they had a combination in the, in the NFL in college. It doesn't matter. The great player has a great coach with him, uh, or a great system that, that kind of goes together. When you, look at, when you look at any of the sustaining teams or sustaining great quarterbacks, they all had a system that allowed them to be good. Hey, it's great to have a chance to talk to you. You people are great. Keep the college football is, don't, don't get worried about it. They're, they're, education is better now for a college athlete than it's ever been, ever. Uh, they're more worked out on it. Our football team has 17 seniors this year. We will graduate every single one of those 17 seniors. And, and that's true all over the country. So a lot of things about college football are better than they've ever been. And, uh, you know, as the old saying, go Hawks. Is that what you say? Go Hawks. John Robinson, everybody. Thank you, Coach. Excellent job. Thanks for being here. Holler Schnellenberger next Monday. We'll see you then. Oh, Tuesday. Yes, next Tuesday. Not Labor Day. Next Tuesday, Holler Schnellenberger. Tuesday.